Linux apps come to Chrome OS stable, but something else came out of Chrome and into Linux. And my Steambox 360 ruffled some feathers for all the wrong reasons, and I love it. LibreOffice 6.11 has been released. It's for early adopters and includes bug fixes for the recently announced 6.1 version. And NextBase is a new desktop environment for Linux. And it is as close as possible to the original Next OS as you can get. And Linus has decided to turn things down just a notch. And unsurprisingly, people kind of have a problem with that. And guess what? Flatpacks, they're going to invade Redmond. Oh, snap. It's going to be a fun time and a fun show because it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we sit Hello. back, relax, take that midweek <laughs> break, and talk about all things Linux, open source, and uh, Katana, Flaming Katana Swords. That's what we're doing this week because of reasons. I'm Vince Stone. That is Jill Bryant in LA mm -hmm. and all the way, the man on the island, one Pedro Monteas. You know him. You love him. Together with you at home, watching us live. It is a, another fantastic Wednesday. Before we get started, we do like to play a little bit of a check in. Pedro, you've done absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. So, Jill, what's up? <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> no, Pedro's done everything. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm getting ready oh. for... Uh... <laughs> I'm getting ready for WordCamp in LA this weekend. It's it's our, our, our local WordPress convention, so that'll be a lot of fun. And there'll be a lot of people from the community there, including, including us Linux Chicks LA and a few people from Linux Gamecast. And um, oh. we're, I'm also getting ready for SUS, SUS Expert Days next week, and that will be a lot of fun. <laughs> Yay! Right on, Pedro. What's up, man? For real. Well, uh, the reason I didn't tap anything in it's the because uh, you what think we're you can get to. away with it every week. I know. <laughs> yeah, and, and also because all I've been doing is worrying about work. Because yeah, we're uh, coming in on the deadline for the big domain move, and we need to get everyone on the new domain. So that means just replacing laptops. That's just the fastest way around it. So we're moving a team, taking their laptops, reimaging them. Uh, handing them out to new people runs repeat, so it's 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 been stressful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, not a whole lot going on over here except for like Monday. I tore everything apart. I am a huge fan of theme music, so I really should have put on like the MacGyver music. It's like, all right, <laughs> we're gonna make a Jordan proof audio chain to send up to Canada, and uh, that was fun. Learned a lot to what you can do with very little. Uh, let's see. I think that was about it. Other than telling people earlier today to come over and scream at my house and oh, my uh, <laughs> Linus poster showed up. That yes. was good. I'm happy that's here, which uh, kind of seems like an interesting thing to start off with because uh, maybe that poster was uh, needs to change instead of saying <laughs> F you at the bottom. It should say hugs for everyone, right? Aww. Free hugs. Open Free source hugs. hugs. <laughs> this is uh, from John O'Bacon's blog. And he writes, man, Linus, his apology and why we should support him. Today, Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, which powers everything. This was like yesterday or day before. From smartwatches posted a pretty remarkable note on the kernel mailing list. And, you know, here's what he wrote. Um, he shared some self-reflection. He's like, this week, people in our community confronted me about my lifetime of not understanding emotions. My flippant attacks in emails have been both unprofessional and uncalled for, especially at times when I made it personal. Okay, that's happened. Uh, in my quest for a better patch, uh, this made sense to me. I know now this was not okay, and I'm truly sorry. So... What are our thoughts on this? Because when I first read this initially, it was like later in the evening and I saw, uh, I was like, uh, he, he's trolling uh, under a hundred percent. He's just, he's saying this and he's going to watch, just watch it, eat some popcorn. Maybe he's not, maybe he's not taking this. Let's see what will happen. Uh, Attitude. Honestly, uh, whether he's playing at something or if this is a genuine, no, the people have been calling me out for a long time, and I'm gonna take a step back and reevaluate a couple of things. Whichever the case, good on you, Linus, for doing something about it. It takes a big man to uh, not just recognize that you're wrong, but to admit it, especially as someone as prominent as Linus. Uh, so yeah, no, it uh, he deserves our support, whichever um, way this plays out. I'm. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm on Team Torvalds. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. He's 
He is, you know, when I first read, I, I love this article that Jono wrote. It was really magnificent. Um, you know, Linus, you know, being one of the most in influential people in technology and one of the giants up, up there with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, you know, it's very in vogue for people to come out and admit their mistakes. And, and I think this was, you know, good, good on him. It's good for the, the gr our growing Linux community and for mm -hmm. the tech community at large. And um, I thought Jono put it beautifully when he said um, he isn't a code base. He is a human being and bugs are harder to spot and fix in humans. Yep. And boy, is that true? And we know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as I was going through this article, I'm realizing, you know, most of us in this community have, you know, we have problems. I mean, it's I, I've noticed this just with among my my friends in the Linux community is that, you know, there's autism, there's dyslexia, there's ADHD, social anxiety. Everyone, you know, in the uber smart communities have something, you know, it's just part of us. <laughs> 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 and, and I, you know, I, I've, I've, yeah, yeah, I've noticed that definitely. So I think, you know, we should all support him because no one is perfect. <laughs> yeah, and to address the big, big elephant in the room, uh, which was the code of conduct, which was implemented yes. almost immediately <laughs> after uh, Linus said that he was going to take a bit of a break. That is a can of worms. Uh, I'm not even going to touch the political implications of it. It's yeah. just that Ven actually pointed out in the notes uh, the uh, one of the... Um, participants in the discussion said that a code of conduct should be a document that describes what will get you kicked out rather than criteria for being allowed to stay. It is fundamentally mm. against open ideology. And I agree. I absolutely agree. If you're going to bring a code of conduct, uh, conduct this late into this particular community, team, whatever you want to call them, it needs to establish with as little wiggle room as possible what isn't okay. It's yeah. uh, everyone's human, and I have no doubt that most people, for all of their issues, for all of their egos, they do have a modicum of common sense, and most of them are willing to apply it liberally. So, if you're <clears throat> trying to dictate how people should act, you need to be very clear about it. Not just for, you know, stifling uh, creativity or anything like that, and... I, I have no illusions that this is not what this is about. It's the you're bringing something new into a community that's been established that we've relied on for this operating system for this long a time. And now you're trying to dictate how they should act. Mm -hmm. That's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. And it has for all the wrong yeah. reasons, too. But it has certainly ruffled a lot it of feathers. Is. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean... Linus is just a person. He needs to take a break. That That's really what everyone yeah. should focus on. It's kind of sad seeing people running out and trying to attach whatever issue mm -hmm. or like thing that they want to, to the, to this, to go with it or trying to like make it a political thing. You people need to go play in traffic. All right. We are dealing with a human being. It's got some issues with some stuff and he's trying to change it. So let's rock yeah. on with that and not awesome. all this other mm -hmm. static that I've seen out there. So yeah. we covered that. We covered it up front. Let's get into <laughs> stuff that's more <laughs> Linuxy than Linus. I don't yes. know how that works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we just had uh, a release uh, of LibreOffice 6.1.1. Um, and this release is for early adopters, technology enthusiasts, and power users. And over 120 bug and regression fix fixes for the recent... Uh, it, this includes over 120 bug and regression fixes for the recently announced LibreOffice 6.1, which is really wonderful. So they're going to, these are, this is the one they're, they're doing a lot of the bug fix, fixes for, for their final release. Yeah. And there, there've been a lot of changes uh, uh, to this. Uh, it, even though there's a lot of bug changes, they've, they rearranged the LibreOffice draw menus and reorganized them. And there's a new page menu mount now. And um, they have uh, new help files that are more detailed and um, have you know, um, uh, better explanations and images in them. And uh, the online version of LibreOffice is still in development, but they've made a lot of changes to that, and it's supposed to, to look a lot better now. And right. I actually did. I actually downloaded and tested the app image, and it worked. It worked really great. Um, if 
seemed okay. to be very very stable so that was awesome yeah one mm. of the uh, the things that they fixed was the uh when inserting an image into a document uh, of any yeah. kind of document there used to be a significant mm. performance impact uh and so now my question is can i now import a two megabyte ping file uh, into <laughs> a document without having to wait for two minutes on two a minutes Ryzen 5 load. 1600 <laughs> with an nvme ssd for it to load <laughs> that would be nice yes <laughs> i don't know yeah it, oh. it did improve that yes <laughs> That's good. Um, I used to use OpenOffice or LibreOffice quite a bit uh, before we built a new system just for like show notes. And it could import it. So I'm glad to see speed increases mainly because that was always cross your fingers and like wait 30 yeah. seconds because we get yes. some really big show notes. Go check them out after the show at LetXGameCast.com. Shameless plug. Um, I'm guessing you put this one in here, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> no cubes. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. But I do love these pretty effects. Yes. <laughs> it's a uh, live animation. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, before the uh, the whole Linus thing happened, everyone was talking about, oh, wobbly windows are back. They're back. Yeah, they haven't gone anywhere. You can still use compass. Well, n not in GNOME or Cinnamon or any of the heavy uh, GTK3 based uh, desktop environments, but you could still use Compass. KDE has wobbly windows, so they haven't got anywhere. But with this, uh, this is a lib animation. It was created by one of the original uh, Compass developers. And uh, what he's done is basically create a compositor agnostic uh, library that will handle all of the wishy wishy whiz bang animations that you get mm -hmm. with your um desktop environment i for one would much prefer if uh, someone was to work on a desktop environment agnostic uh compositor uh that would work uh, or that would allow you to replace say mutter in gnome or in cinnamon uh replace uh, the kwin compositor in kde you can use uh, Compton in some of them, but it, it's not ideal. Uh, so I would very much like to see that DE agnostic compositor instead. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that actually, I I definitely agree with that. And you know, as I was reading through this, I'm thinking, okay, they want to do uh, what uh, Kwin has done for for GNOME. So <laughs> so you know, all yeah. those beautiful <laughs> effects in in KDE Plasma. <laughs> So, and I, I like those. So as long as they're nice and stable, that's really great. And it's nice to have, it'll be nice to have yet another alternative to Compiz. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think it's all horrifying and you people are <laughs> mental cases. It, it's, it's, no, I listen, admittedly way back when, when was that? Like 2005, 2006, when the cube rolled out. Yeah. And <laughs> that was neat. I played around with that and I said, this is not practical. Um, <laughs> So to understand this correctly, what do we have? This is going to bring those effects to GNOME Shell, Pedro? Yeah, it's going to bring them to GNOME, to Cinnamon. Uh, it's basically creating that effect layer on top of whichever compositor happens to be running. So you could, in theory, make this work on top of Compton, on top of um, Kwin, on top of Metacity, because that has a built-in compositor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, no, it's uh, compositor agnostic, pretty, pretty animations, if you're into that. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds Yay! truly horrifying, but hey, if it's your thing, <laughs> rock on, because I know people really enjoy pretty desktops, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's cool. Speaking of pretty desktops, I mean, crashy desktops, wait, no, pretty crashy desktops? <laughs> <laughs> the two are not mutually exclusive. It's uh, Plasma 5.13.90, and it's got some new features. Uh, they have... Um, New display configuration widget uh, directly from the system tray. So you, if you plug in an external monitor, instead of having to open the screen settings, you can just do it directly from the uh, from the desktop. They've improved the system monitor. They've improved widget management. Uh, the um, global menu, if you have that set up, uh, will support uh, GTK applications out of the box. Uh, they've also improved a couple of more things, Kwin and Wayland. Uh, and the two bug fixes that they mention in this particular post are mm -hmm. blurred backgrounds behind desktop context menus are no longer visually <laughs> corrupted because that 
was a thing that was urgent, and it's no longer possible to accidentally drag and drop task manager buttons into app windows, because that was another thing that was so very urgent instead of, oh, I don't know, fixing all the crashing with Kwin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, those are they should have really focused on a lot of those, mm-hmm. those issues for <laughs> sure. Yeah, <laughs> instead they made lots of user interface changes and whatnot, which is good. But they need to go fix their bugs. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I like that they're making progress towards Wayland though. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. no, that's really awesome. And they did uh, actually change their their software center Plasma Discover uh, in a big way. They added FW. UPD support for updating your firmware and they added mm-hmm. snap channels and they've it, it's much more organized um I I ran it from a live USB and and it actually looked really good it's one of the nicest looking software centers of any distro actually and uh they also added a new display configuration widget for screen management which is always needed we always yeah. <laughs> need more of this <laughs> which is great of course for multi monitor configuration and doing presentations so and and it's Especially now, since AMD is in the in in the running for GPUs, it's nice to have these options because they don't have these options uh, like Nvidia does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. Next, it's a thing. It won't die. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Zombie so. <laughs> Steve Jobs reaches out and puts something on your desktop. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm really, really excited about this. This is. NextSpace. NextSpace is an object-oriented desktop environment that brings next step, yay, look and feel to Linux as close as possible to the original Next OS. And um, it uses Window Maker, um, X Window Manager, which is one of my favorite window managers um, for the user interface, which is really wonderful. And it includes, it actually has many updates that aren't included in the main Window Maker GUI, which I really, mm-hmm. really, really appreciate. And I can't wait to run this. Um, it has a um, uh, display preferences now and a media menu to mount and unmount drives. You used to have to back in the day install dock apps to do to do these functions. So it's really nice that that's automatically in the the GUI. And um, the sad thing is, is though he said right now he's only going to be supporting CentOS seven. So I'm going to have to get my uh, Cent- CentOS box and, and upgrade it and, and install this on it so I can play with it. <laughs> this is like the dark old days. Um, my, first, my first thought with this, because one of the first uh, window managers I used was AfterStep. Yes, mm-hmm. and definitely. And this definitely reminds me of that. Is AfterStep just no longer in uh, development or is this just uh, a continuation on that? What exactly? Yeah, it's... And after step is actually, it's just a slow at development, but they, they do update it every once in a while. And, uh, no. yeah. So, uh, but, but what is interesting, there is another one in the community called GNU step, mm-hmm. which is a free implement implementation of open step, which is mm-hmm. based on next step <laughs> <laughs> and its applications can be installed on any Linux distro or from the GNU step live CD or USB. Uh, which I yeah. have that on s- several of my systems. I've always loved uh, GNU Step. And my um, thought, uh, my first yeah. thought when I saw this was like, okay, so Iculus was complaining <laughs> about people submitting bug reports when using Awesome. <laughs> what will he <laughs> say when people start submitting bug reports saying that uh, Next Space, uh, oh. some game or another, is crashing? <laughs> He's going to say yeah. what a logical person would say, "Quit running CentOS for gaming." <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. That's well, Window good. Maker, Window Maker, by the way, is a beautiful OS to run games on. It runs multi-monitor games just beautifully, and that, that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Uh, and um, but actually, uh, uh, I've always been wanting a Next Cube in my vintage computer <laughs> collection for years. I used one in my college years in the early '90s. So I've been wanting one of those machines. There's several thousand dollars on eBay. If anyone knows <laughs> knows one out there that's cheaper, I'd be willing to buy one off you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want a next cube. <laughs> They're beautiful, but yeah. So all the all the information here is in the show notes, and there's there's even yes. a long article on the evolution of next to open step to after step to <laughs> and and beyond. So it's all yeah. there. <laughs> 
So, uh, from um, the past to the future, back to the past. Uh, yeah, this article came out uh, in June, but uh, the changes that they made to the base Chromium uh, uh, have only just now actually made it into the, um, well, the main mainline Chrome uh, browser. So... What they did was, uh, this is from the Intel open source uh, blog, and what they did is they found a way, very clever way, to bypass the uh, graphical server and just have the libva API talk directly to the Intel uh, integrated graphics to let that take care of all the acceleration and the display compositing and everything else, and... That's how uh, they've managed to accomplish uh, w even running Celerons, like the those Chromebooks that run on Celerons like mine. Um, you can play 1080p videos easily without it even breaking a sweat. And the, the reason for that is this very clever implementation that they did. So now... It's officially available for Linux, uh, so if you have the current Chrome and you noticed a slight performance improvement in videos and whatnot from the um, from the latest Chrome update, this is why. <laughs> it's kind of neat, man. I'm yeah. definitely digging this. Uh, you got any thoughts on this one, Jill? Yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, I I thought it was really really good good uh, for them to you know, uh, get rid of the middleman in between, um, the web browser and the, and the GUI by eliminating X 11. It really, really speeds it up as Pedro was mm -hmm. saying. And it's, it, it's, you know, that, that's one of the problems that actually with a lot of the web kiosk, uh, distros is, uh, they're, they're pretty slow actually. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. this, this, this will really, really help Chrome OS, um, uh, uh, Chrome web browser under um linux and um, all the user interfaces so that's really awesome i think that's kind of neat and wasn't it earlier this week that even firefox has rolled out some gl acceleration finally yes yep. yeah so yeah they did plenty of things mm -hmm. to take advantage of that uh, but it's chrome os it's great we're all going to be running it in the future <laughs> you have no well, choice. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> tuxedo nano <laughs> Eight. Uh, don't call it a rebadge, Nook, because that's not what it is. Quit. No, yeah, it no, is. no, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so it's an i7 quad core, 32 gigajoules of RAM. Uh, you can get a spinny drive, SSD, M.2. It's got Visa mounting. If you want to attach a monitor to it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. uh, you want to attach it to the back of a monitor to, you know, create the fake all-in-one that some people are so fond of. <laughs> but doesn't yes. this, this, this comes uh, preloaded? This is from Tuxedo Computer, so it, it's got some Linux on yeah. it out of the box, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. You have your choice of Ubuntu, Ubuntu Budgie, or OpenSUSE 15, um, which is really awesome. And they even said you can uh, dual boot it with Windows, but why bother with that? So... <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but anyways yeah it's just like like a nook it, they are if you compare prices the, it is a little uh, bit more expensive um with the, with the the same specs but um it's still it's it's nice to support a manufacturer that installs linux on their machines <laughs> yeah and tuxedo seriously major kudos to them for sending me the infinity book uh, yes. a while back that was a genuinely genuinely awesome laptop uh, and if I'm assuming that the versions of Ubuntu that they supply for the uh, Tuxedo Nano uh, are very much in line with what they were providing for the uh, the Infinity Book, and I'll be damned if the, they didn't actually succeed in optimizing Ubuntu to use at most 15 watts if the laptop was in battery. That was uh -huh. actually impressive to see. It would not go above 15 watts. Whoa. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely neat. Uh, 498 yeah. euros. So that's about yeah. 6 million Canadian. Um, <laughs> that's not terribly expensive, especially once after you've even assembled a Nook. I mean, there's not too much of a premium on that. No. No. So. no and, and, and actually it has an, um, what was neat is even in, in the base level, it has um, a nice SSD, a 250 gig SSD um, um, mm -hmm. M2 SATA already installed in the, in, um, 
it was actually That's more cheaper. than you get yeah with barebone nooks <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so i was really impressed by that <laughs> all right uh can you make use of the macbook air touchpad on ubuntu <laughs> Well, you can now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, mm -hmm. where's this from? Interactive.com. <laughs> it's a bit, you know, if you're a longtime MacBook Air user and you recently switched to Linux, I bet one of the things you'll miss most is the multi-touch touchpad. And apparently they had blogged earlier, but they basically walk you through lib input and how to get everything with Mtrack up and working. Hey, look, you get to compile code. Mm -hmm. That's a fun <laughs> learning experience. Some people yeah. like that. Uh, you you're a resident uh laptop strays adopter so look, yes pedro you probably know all this stuff right uh i know for a fact that uh, when it comes to multi-touch support for trackpads on linux it's been non-existent and the uh, fault of that lies squarely on lib input uh if we could replace that with M-Track or anything else mm -hmm. that allows for more, you know, allows for some actual gestures and whatnot in the trackpad so you can actually use those trackpads with all the functionality that they have in those other operating systems. It's not just MacBooks. It's also very, very prevalent in uh, your typical run-of-the-mill laptops that yeah. you can pick up secondhand really, really cheap. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's. Uh, would you like to do a pinch for Zoom? Can't do that on Linux. Would you like to do um, like the uh, the circle with two fingers to do some kind of weird thing or weird transition? Whatever the case may be, can't do that on Linux. Uh, the three finger scroll. Yeah. Can't do that. <laughs> So yeah, no, it needs better support. There, there's a lot of missing functionality, and this is possibly right now one of the areas that Linux falls the shortest on, and it's squarely down to lib input. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm actually, you know, this I'm, I'm going to be installing it on one of my machines for sure because, uh, yeah, having the, the three fingered swipe, um, mm -hmm. I use all the all the time, and um, it's it's hard not having that functionality and. Um, in Linux, and uh, the M-Track driver solves this, but of course it doesn't work with Wayland, so that is an yeah. issue. <laughs> so um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of neat. That's a handy guide. Even I've got to got to admit though, when you go look at it, that is a wall of text. So mm -hmm. <laughs> might be a good weekend project if you need that, or if you like me, just buy a tablet. They're really cheap because everyone's trying to get rid of them now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. <laughs> When was this? This was like Sunday afternoon. I'd got the show out. Uh, didn't really monitor anything. <laughs> hey. and I, we get just <laughs> boom. We, we get slammed with traffic when we release a Saturday show on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I didn't even notice this. This wasn't enough to blip my radar until I came back maybe about two, two and a half hours to swap things out for how we're delivering stuff. It's like, why are we still getting so much HTTP traffic? This doesn't <laughs> make sense to the Googles. <laughs> Let's track this back. And that mm -hmm. led me to a uh, post over at Hackaday that had something quite familiar on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very Pedro. familiar indeed. So that made me uh, all, the, all the happy. I was giving Jill uh, a run for her money when it comes to the giggling. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was, yeah, uh, Tom Nardi from Hackaday uh, picked up uh, on a tip from Mike, which is apparently not empty. So I'm looking squarely at Mike G right now. And uh, uh, he posted, it's like, yeah, uh, someone built a... Um, Linux powered Steam box uh, or a Steam powered Xbox 360, as he called it in the article, and people went mental on him in the mm -hmm. comments because the first thing I did is like I read the article and then immediately went for the comments because I need validation. Uh, and uh, after I was done reading the comments, people were really disappointed that this wasn't an actual Xbox 360 that was being powered by a, um, I don't know, a Steam boiler. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, people were really, really disappointed. Uh, but hey, uh, nothing like uh, reading the comments to ground you back down in reality, I guess. Although I am happy to report, since this isn't the the gaming show, that you can watch Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime with minimal uh, Steam controller futzing. Uh, you can watch those really, really is easily uh, on the uh, built-in Steam browser nowadays, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. I think it's definitely a good thing, <laughs> and it, it's a very valid thing that you can make an HTPC and shove it inside of an Xbox 360, and it's your own fault for reading comments on videos. 
um, which I knew that was an article. Immediately going to do, and I mean, it, that's why I didn't immediately tell you about it because Jordan and I had to make like sixteen accounts at Hackaday to mm-hmm. get all those comments in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. But you know, LGC cares. That's how that works. Yeah. So that's a it's, fun thing, and yeah. um, some people don't like to Google. We learned that on YouTube. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, there was one person that yeah. was really insistent. So what games can it run? Can it run Rust, Arma 3, uh, Days yeah. and uh, <laughs> I don't play any of those games. You could, you know, I don't know, try Googling for those games the with a 2400G. Right, uh, that is something maybe we need to point out. Putting it inside of an Xbox doesn't change the hardware's ability to hardware. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, and uh, immediately he comes back, oh, okay, lol, so what do you play? And I told him everything that I could play uh, on this box, Dark Souls 2, Dirt Rally. Uh, also, Pedro didn't realize that some people are really bad at initiating conversations, and he was just trying to say hello. Mm-hmm. And uh, I finished I finished my, uh, my second reply by saying, you know, if you Google for minimum system requirements, you can mm-hmm. see what the 2400G can do all by yourself. You don't need to go bothering people on the internet. And then Ven commented, so what can it play? Why not? <laughs> Listen, I'm helpful. Aww. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, well, what did you think? I mean, we're yeah. all happy about it, right? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I actually am very... I'm so proud of Pedro in his Steambox 360 adventures. It's beautifully crafted, and you paid attention to every detail, both technically and artistically. And most of the comments I read on Google Plus and Twitter were all, all uh, praise. They're wonderful. So, <laughs> so Thank you, Joe. It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. All right. Uh, something I want to give a little plug to is uh, during my audio adventures, uh, eventually this is going to get all written out, is uh, – a little bit of a plug-in. Maybe if you use the jack and you use a digital audio workstation known as a DAW, you're going to have an LV2 plug-in where you're going to have several of them do different things. And this one I really enjoyed using for broadband noise reduction. Easiest thing I found. And it's just called Noise Repellent. You can build it. I'll probably put a little guide to setting this thing up. But it's got an adjustable noise floor, uh, spectral gating, and spectral subtraction suppression rules pretty awesome soft bypasses and it's really neat kids all i'm going to say Mm -hmm. is you can throw this i'm using this with our door right now and let's say we're doing a live stream right because you can always go back and post and even in audacity which is like a wave editor you can just do a sample of the background noise and just apply that and usually that's going to get you 95 96 percent of the way there uh, killing any background but if you want to do it live and you don't want to spend any extra money you can add this to just your basic mixer in Outdoor, stack it, and it's got an option. It's like, learn the background noise. It'll sit there. It'll do that. And just automatically, like you would expect it to, smash that down a few dB and uh, keep your audio, whatever you're actually trying to make noise with, sounded nice. good. Nice. I'm liking it. Nice. I just wanted to give that plug in a quick little mention. Mainly I learned about it because I was trying to fix Jordan's audio before Jordan fixed his audio. <laughs> I'm just glad to have that tool in our arsenal now. So let's bash on Microsoft. Yeah, we haven't had that enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Initial flatback support arrives for Windows and subsystem for Linux. Yeah, that's the that's a real thing. Flatback on Windows. It's got mm-hmm. some hacky workarounds, but it basically works. I'm surprised that wasn't from Microsoft's official Twitter account. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alexander Larson, the lead developer and creator of Flatback Package System, has announced that the software works on Windows subsystem for Linux. That's WSL. If you know that, Larson announced the developer development via Twitter, but didn't give too much information away, such as how to get it set up yourself. He did say, however, that it required hacky workarounds. Due to WSL constraints, sandboxing is somewhat limited. Oh, kind of like it is on Linux? Question mark? Yeah. <laughs> well, on Linux, flat packs uh, can do a pretty good job of sandboxing. It's just that I'm guessing it's very hard to sandbox on an operating system designed from the ground up to not sandbox anything. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, that yeah. was kind of my first thought. I was like, how about we get snaps and flat packs like sandboxing stuff properly and people actually doing that correctly before we go infecting Microsoft. And I was like, wait, wait, infecting Microsoft? <laughs> as you were. Continue. Yeah, as you yes. were. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all we all know that the that that using this as a it it, it 
makes this the superior uh <laughs> software downloader <laughs> <laughs> under windows <laughs> all jokes aside i mean feel free to write in and because i genuinely know nothing about windows past like 311 for work groups intentionally um <laughs> is there anything else is, is there's i'm guessing there's just like a windows store now because i've heard a lot about that Yes, there is the Windows Store, and uh, Microsoft would very much like you to get all of your applications from there, but no one does, because, well, it's Windows. People always went to the internet and downloaded an EXE that's totally legit from totallylegit.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, yeah, that's... I guess uh, the Microsoft did have an attempt at doing this, and they're still doing it, I think, with the universal Windows apps and the universal Windows platform. Uh, which is just uh, games for Windows Live under a different name. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's good to see Flatpaks actually working, even if it does require some hacky workarounds. And I'm guessing the reason Microsoft mm. were the ones making this announcement is because they're currently trying to work to smooth out the rough edges so this works just out of the box. Yeah. And they can go, look, Flatpaks on Windows, there you go. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't look like Microsoft had anything to do with this. This was the developer Flatpak going, ah, look, you know, doing what developers do. Look, I made some yeah, work. Yeah. Out <laughs> you know, this is doom on a toaster, man. Uh, it's interesting. I would like to see something like that for, you know, the people who are stuck running Windows that could just install and maybe we could, they could use FlatHub. There would just be a Windows mm -hmm. version of it and it would have a frowny face on it. And then it would try to make you install Edge. And. <laughs> No, no, no. You already yeah. have Edge. You don't need to install another browser. Right? Come on. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> wow, Microsoft. I can't believe you did that. I know you backtracked on it and you were like, it's worth a try, right? And it's like, you Edge has 4% market share. Just let it go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no one's that desperate. Um, hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to put a bow on it and wrap it up before we do. We got a little bit of feedback coming up. We do need to thank some people. I mean, if you want to kick us some coin, you like the show and you're like, Hey man, they do this every week. And, uh, we don't like nail you with ads or anything like that. And we do like five shows a week. Consider maybe if you can kicking us a few shekels, make it range just a little bit honest. You can do that at linuxemcast.com forward slash support. We got Patreon. That's uh, we got a goal. We are mm, tasting a goal. Mm. We got Amazon mm -hmm. affiliate links, new egg humble. Humble's got some books. I just gave humble a chunk of money last night. Cause it was like a gaming book and yeah. I wanted the Vulcan book, PayPal, bitcoins, all that. But, uh, really the best way to help us out is with Patreon because it gives us a budget and that's what we're working for. We are currently one dollar mm. away from doing a legitimate merch run. This has Yay. been a little bit of a unicorn for us. We <laughs> almost get there. We almost yeah. get there. Then we'll get like the last week of the month and it's like, man, it'll be yeah. gone. Just minus one dollar. Like, oh man. So we want to do some uh, t shirts and some stuff like that and just get it out there. But we want to make sure the interest is there before we push that out. So if you've been thinking about it, it's like, hey man, I could spare four quarters a week. Um, mm -hmm. to help us do this. Plus we're going to be spending some extra money because I'm thinking about getting Pedro some, uh, fancier stuff. Maybe uh, we're, we're going to turn him into a real YouTuber. <laughs> Nori already said I could dye your hair red. <laughs> could have picked the worst color to be honest. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be a thing. And we're going to be shipping some stuff up to Canada. We, uh, one of the things we're working on right now is, duplicating to make the studio itself Raptor bus proof. Mm -hmm. So if there's never an issue here, there's going to be, you know, beat a site and we'll be able to get that up and running. But, uh, we had somebody increase their plan. Yeah. We yes, we do. Yes. Uh, Yay. A certain penguin that likes to roam around very free. That goes by the name of Matt Hartley. Yes. Matt, Thank Matt you. Hartley. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Very, very Thank much. You so uh, much. That's freedompenguin.org, yeah. I believe, right? Or freedom yeah, uh, he, he does his, his, his own beautiful uh, YouTube videos on Linux. He's, he's one yes. of my favorite people I follow as a patron. And he's getting so. a new HDMI <laughs> capture card because he yes, posted he is. on Twitter. Yes. And I was like, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Did you just ask that question to the internet without talking to me first? <laughs> Here, get this. I know it works 100%. We're still going to make yeah. that page of stuff as we know works with Linux, like the weird, bizarre stuff like that. Cause, <laughs> um, but good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, freedompenguin.org. It better not be yep. .com or .net. Uh, just type freedom yeah. into the URL bar yeah. you'll get there yes <laughs> right. so we get a little bit of slice pie a couple things pizza pie yes, we do. Yep. Yes. 
<laughs> this is awesome. This is how to install Nginx on the Raspberry Pi. And, and actually, it, it's just as easy to install on the Raspberry Pi, of course, as any Lin Linux distro. They've made it uh, wonderfully easy to install. And now you can make a LAMP uh, web server, uh, Linux, Nginx, MySQL, and PHP web st server instead of a LAMP web server with the Raspberry Pi. So that's really awesome. And this, uh, the article has, a, it's actually beautifully written. It's got um, all the detail on how to install Nginx. And that's all in our notes, show notes. And uh, th this is really awesome because Nginx is a really, really good um, um, alternative to Apache uh, to teach people how to install a web server. And um, yep. it's, yeah, very easy to use. And um, I support them wholeheartedly. So I could say 100% really cool. to that. Um, <laughs> it does roll down to, you know, if you get like a Pi 3, like B plus or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. like if you only want like, I, I don't know, what would you use it for? Maybe like a wiki doc server or something like that? Possibly? Yeah, wiki, uh, WordPress would be really, really good to run no, away. No, it would Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, all right. all right, maybe if you wanted to test and see if something would technically work at the end of the day, but yeah, no, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. people do not run WordPress. Uh, do do that. that, I mean, you can uh, videotape it. I'd like to watch it for my amusement. But, um, <laughs> and if you want to have like a teeny tiny little yeah. gateway running off of a web server yeah. in your home network, yeah. It's all Engine power X to on you. your pie. Yeah. And it's Engine mm -hmm. X. It's so easy to set up out of Yay, the box. I love and Nginx. <laughs> just, yeah, I, I was blown away by that. I, I come from way back in the Apache days and I set up Engine X like last year. I did it again this year. I was like, wait, that then opened the config file and it's human readable. And I was like, yeah, this, this is exactly. boring. I don't want to play with this. <laughs> and um, that's brilliant. Good, good, good. So uh, let's mm -hmm. let's hack into our own computers, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, or uh, set up a security system, which uh, I guess you're if you're running Windows like this person, it's not going to be very secure. But hey, it was an interesting concept because he took a Raspberry Pi and a uh, an RFID reader, uh, and he paired that with that card that he's using right there in the little video. And whenever he moves a card away from the RFID reader, his uh, Windows session locks, and when he puts it back in, it unlocks. And that, that right there is very, very clever use of Python and um, uh, HID, because that's what it's doing. The moment you put it in, it sends the unlock command, and the moment you take it out, it sends the lock command. So... Mm -hmm. very simple mm -hmm. very straightforward it's the kind of thing that you look at it's like huh why didn't i ever think of doing this and then you start to remind yourself that you don't have any rfid stuff kicking about the house that's why i didn't do it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you know what actually this is a lot of the techniques they use in hotel rooms you know to, mm -hmm. to for like at def, def con to hack your hotel room so this this is a perfect area for the pie <laughs> <laughs> I think that is definitely neat. I mean, that that's one of those things you're gonna do. It's like, oh, it's so cool. A week later, you'll never use it again. But mm -hmm. still, that is really neat. I enjoy that. Maybe you know something neat, and you want to tell us about it. What's the best way to go about doing that, Pedro? You could do that very easily by going to LinuxGameCast.com. You hit the contact button and you shout at our face. No, no, no. You actually type down what you want to say to us. Yell at my Make house. Sure Yes, yell at Vent House. He wants to test some, uh, <laughs> soundproofing. Uh, <laughs> uh, just make sure to pick LWDW from the little choosy box and uh, your name, your email address, the usual stuff, as well as the captcha. Make sure uh, that uh, if your feedback requires some background knowledge of something we didn't cover on the show, provide links for that, please. Mm. That that would be helpful. <laughs> and if you're re referencing something from like a billion years ago in the future's past, like throw that in. It's like, I was just watching the episode where you talked about, uh, uh, listen, podcast yeah. amnesia <laughs> is a real thing. Yeah, uh, yes. You, you oh, yes. What you said, even though, I mean, you're fully there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is it. So uh, we do have uh, some random Cody guy. 
Yeah, week. some random Cody guy who asks, so I've been running KDE Neon for a bit. Uh, I really enjoy it. However, one thing really bothers me. I got up to date KDE toys. Is there uh, is the trade-off worth it, though? Uh, what I mean is having an outdated Ubuntu base worth having all these up-to-date KDE toys, or should we all just run Kubuntu and deal with those nasty KDE bugs? Well, as someone who's uh, been running KDE on a pretty up-to-date distro... I can tell mm-hmm. you that a stable base is often the best <laughs> choice. It's um, to no fault of Solus on this one. This lies squarely with KDE. Uh, if you keep everything that's running in the background as tried and true as possible, except for, you know, the KDE stuff, uh, you're probably going to have a much better experience than, say, having up-to-date KDE and really bleeding-edge kernel and exorg and whatnot. Just ask a random Arch user if they like the KDE experience. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. If, uh, I have Neon in one of my uh, stray laptops. And, uh, yes, if you install just the ISO that is publicly available now, you get Ubuntu 16.04, which, yes, it's a bit old, but it's still very much uh, actively supported, so you're not completely outdated. But uh, you can rebase it to 18.04. The beta is currently ongoing, and I did that in that laptop, and it's uh, running without issue, so... I don't know, man. There's (laughs) definitely people who are going to look at, like, uh, 18.04 and go, Oh, that's so old! (laughs) <laughs> i remember i used yeah. to be this person before i had to uh, construct boxes that had to work period <laughs> yes yeah. exactly but that was part exactly. of the fun with it playing with the bleeding edge and i think that's what arch is good for if you want to stay the latest mm-hmm. and greatest what are your thoughts on yeah. that page or like hey when you get like the new sauce for all the things that way yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> as the uh, Steam box uh, proved, the Linux support for the 2400G wasn't great, and uh, kudos to Empty, which I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, yesterday in Discord, mm-hmm. he uh, said that, uh, well, he brought up a PSA that there's an issue. If you have a an AMD motherboard and you got the most recent BIOS and it runs a GSA um, version 1.0.0.4 or higher, you really want to downgrade Mm -hmm. it to something like 1.0.0.2 or 0.1a or really whatever your um, motherboard happens to support because with version.4 on Linux, it causes issues very similar to what I'm experiencing with the Steam box. And even though I had... um, a GSA 0.4 on the Steam box, and I reverted to version 1.0.0.1a. It's still displaying some of those issues, so there's definitely mm-hmm. something between Linux and that particular APU and this motherboard that's still a bit finicky, so I'm still waiting for improvements on that end. And <laughs> always keep in mind uh, that people like you and Pedro and Empty are cool. Some of us have like MSI B350 boards where you can't downgrade the BIOS. Mm-hmm. So yeah. keep Ooh. keep that in mind before you pull the trigger. And uh, here, yeah, here, here, peace, yeah. Peace with sound advice from old man Vin. If it works when it comes to BIOS, don't fix it. Don't fix mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. Do you got yeah. any suggestions on this, Jill? For yeah, uh, no, definitely. Um, I'm I have uh, an arch box I use to install the latest and greatest. But for my workflow, it's stable all the way, no matter what distro. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to do to, to do everything from rendering to podcasting. This box is a 1604 box for broadcasting and it's been great for that. And um, yeah, so I stick to I stick to stable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all the things. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. I think uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Weekly Daily Wednesdays with the Linux 136. We're going to bounce out of here. But first, mm-hmm. we need to uh, put up some credits. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and thank our, all our beautiful patrons. <laughs> yes, all of them. Yay. If you don't yes. know them, just uh, wait a couple more seconds. Their names will be on screen. Yeah. <laughs> if you see them uh, going down the street, give them a hug. Unless they yes. don't want to. <laughs> don't listen to Pedro. Do not go randomly hugging people. That's how you know. Aww. <laughs> If you ever see me, do not ever consider as like, I'm going to give him a hug. He looks grumpy. Don't. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. I think 
you'd get hit on the head, Pedro, if you did that <laughs> with a fist. <pen. laughs> not a particularly huggy person. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Aw, okay. poor Ben. Bye. Bye, chat room. We love you.